and you're on. All right, thank you. So I'm Robert Heath. This is lecture number nine, the Wireless Communications Lab. I see the, the class is slowly dwindling down. Eventually, we're going to get to like three students attending every lecture here. Hopefully, everyone is just watching it online. Uh, so today, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to continue the discussion of uh, pulse shaping, in particular, how to implement it efficiently at the receiver. So we'll um, derive a, um, an appropriate structure where we can replace that analog matched filtering operation with something equivalent in discrete time. And we're going to do that using some of the principles of discrete time equivalent of a continuous time system and the concept of oversampling. And then, after that, we're going to shift into detection theory. So we're going to start to talk about some of the other functions that the receiver is performing. In this case, the detection. So how does it figure out exactly um, which symbol it thinks was sent? So we're going to derive the maximum likelihood detector for the additive white Gaussian noise channel. And so you should be able to do that derivation for other kinds of likelihood problems. And then you should also be able to implement it. And you will implement that in the lab as well. Either you've already implemented it or you do it next week. And then finally, we will go through the probability of symbol error analysis for that maximum likelihood detector. So essentially, you want to compute some expression that tells us how often we are wrong, that detector is wrong, as a function of the signal-to-noise ratio. Now, it's going to turn out to be um, complicated to compute the exact expression. If you take a more advanced digital communications course, you will compute the exact expression. So instead, we're going to uh, compute an upper bound that works for a variety of different modulation techniques. And so you should be able to calculate that upper bound and then also, I will give you the exact expression for QAM, even though we won't derive it. And so you should be able to use that expression and also the union bound to plot probabilities of symbol error. OK. So with that, let's start off with just a quick review of what we did at the end of the last lecture. So at the end of lecture number eight, uh, we went through this process here of changing how we implement the transmit structure. So here we had this create pulse train, pulse shaping filter operation. So in lecture number eight, we showed that using the band limited property of the pulse shaping operation here, because the pulse shaping operation creates an X of T signal that's band limited, we know that we can equivalently represent X of T by its samples. And using the reconstruction formula, and doing some simplification, we showed that we could replace this um, operation here with this equivalent operation down here. And so we moved effectively the filtering into discrete time. So it shows up over here. This is this, the sampled pulse shaping filter. And then the, I should put this here, the discrete to continuous converter was being operated at some symbol period divided by L. So we're actually operating the discrete to continuous converter at a rate faster than the symbol rate, unless L is equal to 1. But normally, L would be greater than 1 if we have any excess bandwidth at all. And so, uh, and then this right here, upsampling by L. So effectively what happens is the symbols come in. We interleave those symbols with zeros. We filter with this um, discrete time filter. And then we convert that to a continuous time signal and then scale that in the analog domain by the square root of EX here. Now the piece that we didn't talk about in class, and uh, I think we'll have it on the next homework assignment, is that if you think about this operation here, this right here is, is just a filter. And so by choosing L greater than 1, like 2 or 4, we create a lot of samples of this filter for every symbol. And so 
the complexity of this convolution, generally speaking, goes up with L. But if you realize that this upsampling operation inserts zeros, and there's no complexity to multiplying by zero if we know that there's a zero there, it turns out that it's possible to simplify this structure and create a structure that looks like this down here. So we won't go through the derivation, but um, even though this looks more complicated, what this does is it effectively shifts the upsampling from here over to here. And by doing that, you replace a filter of length, let's say, NL, by a bunch of filters of length L here. These are, this is called a polyphase decomposition. And the main reason to do this is to, to reduce complexity here. And so that's essentially pulse shaping of the transmitter. So for, for most practical purposes, you can just you know, draw this block diagram. And in fact, you can implement this, this in LabVIEW as well. You don't have to implement the more efficient version. But if you read any book that's specifically on software-defined radio, there'll be like a whole chapter on these kinds of structures because these structures will reduce complexity quite a bit. All right, so any questions on transmit pulse shaping before we go to receive pulse shaping? All right, so let's move now to the receiver. And so the trick here is going to be, you know, how can we get rid of the um, receive filtering, the receive match filtering in analog, and how can we somehow put it into digital? So let's start off by looking at the, um, the receive pulse shaping, the receive block diagram that we we're considering. And that starts off with something like, I'm going to use this letter Z here so I can use Y later. Some Z of T coming in to some receive filter. There's a continuous to discrete converter operating at the symbol rate. It operates at a symbol rate because we're using the very special uh, Nyquist pulse shape. And then here we have the detection block that we're going to derive the ingredients of that later today. And then the inverse symbol mapping block. And producing their, our estimate of the bits here. Okay, so this detection we're going to do later today. Now what we're going to do is we want to figure out how can we somehow shift this over to here. Now, it's not exactly straightforward because remember that we already established that we are undersampling the signal. So sampling at the symbol rate in most cases is not the Nyquist rate. And so we're not sampling the signal enough. So to get around that, though, what we do is we're going to use, um, so we're, we're going to implement this with using that same concept as before, using the discrete time processing of a continuous time signal. So we're going to replace this operation, this continuous time filter here was something in discrete time. And so to do that, we are going to um, plug in here. So let's put Z of T here. So we're going to put a continuous to discrete converter here. And I'm going to put here that this is going to operate at some T of Z, T sub Z, not necessarily T. I'm going to have the GRX of N in the middle here. And then at the output, a discrete to continuous converter operating again at TZ. Sorry, TZ. And then this will be followed by a continuous to discrete converter operating at T. The detection. And then this 
symbol mapping operation here. Okay, so this is what we're proposing to do here. So first of all, let's, um, let's look at what the coefficients of GRX of N are. So first of all, we can do this whole thing because Z of T is band limited, right? So Z of T is is band limited, and then um, the bandwidth is determined. Remember by the bandwidth of the transmit pulse shaping filter GTX of T, which is matched to GRX. And so if we're using a band-limited transmit pulse shape, then we can also suppose that the receive signal is band-limited. Now, in reality, you'd have a filter somewhere here, an analog filter that band-limits the receive signal so you don't pick up extra noise. But we're assuming that that's already happened during the down-conversion process. So ZFT is band-limited here. And the GRX we know from... Uh, the the earlier lectures that this should be something like T Z G R X of N T Z here. So that's what we derived earlier, uh, several lectures ago. But what we're going to do is because scaling by this T Z here doesn't change any of the signal processing, we're going to um, just we can just arbitrarily take it to be 1. This just doesn't matter here. So we're just going to assume that GRX of N is equal to the sampled GRX of TZ. Now in your implementation, you can scale this um, as you like. Okay. Now the other issue is how we pick TZ. So we also know that we need to select TZ such that Nyquist is satisfied. So any, any such TZ will do. As long as this, that sample period is small enough, you're fine. But what we want to do is we actually want to um, somehow get rid of this operation here. Because this, this is a little bit silly to convert the signal to continuous time and then to sample it again. So if we pick the TZ and T correctly, there's a way to simplify this. Now, you can actually simplify it even if TZ and T are arbitrary. It's just a little bit uglier. But um, we're going to pick something that simplifies this dramatically here. So we're going to take um, TZ to be equal to the symbol period divided by some M, where M is a positive integer. and chosen such that Nyquist is satisfied. And note that in the case where we take M, sorry, let me see this. In the case where 1 over TZ is greater than Nyquist, so if we sample at a rate that's greater than the minimum, then we call this oversampling. And most receivers implement oversampling for a variety of reasons, uh, many which have to do with the uh, timing and synchronization problems that we'll discuss. So an oversampling by a factor of 8 would not be uncommon. Now, let's go through here and um, plug in exactly what's happening here. So... All right, so if we look at this, um, it turns out that we can simplify this entire process here, this D to C. So this D to C operation here, this is converting to continuous time with a factor of TZ. And then we're going to sample this. Instead of putting a rate T, this is a rate T. 
which is equal to mtz here. So we're converting this to continuous time, and then we're going to take every mth sample of that received signal. So because we're sampling at the um, at a multiple of the the sample period, then you know effectively we're picking up this on the zeros of the sink here, and so it's like we're going to take um, whatever is here. Let's call this uh, lack of a better term here. I can call this let's say y of n. And what I get at the output is going to be y of n times m here. And we can go through and write the reconstruction formula. You can verify this. It turns out that that operation has a name in multi-rate DSP. And this is called a downsampling operation. So the signal processing block that takes a signal at and then throws away every m, every m minus 1 samples is called downsampling. And then just for background, the downsampler um, has the following Fourier property here in the frequency domain. The spectrum looks like this here. It's sum from m equals 0 to capital M minus 1, z of e to the j 2 pi f over m minus j 2 pi little m over big M here. And I'm giving this to you here to note that when you perform downsampling, see that you get this right here, which looks sort of like aliasing. And this kind of makes sense, because if you take a signal that's been sampled appropriately at Nyquist, and then you throw half the samples away, you cannot expect that Nyquist is still satisfied. And so we end up getting something that's kind of like aliasing. The, the main difference between this and the aliasing formula we had in continuous time is that there's only a sum from 0 to m minus 1. It's not a sum over an infinite number of replicas. So if you downsample by 2, you're effectively taking the spectrum of the signal, rescaling, and then adding a, an appropriate replica. So it would be something like, you know, discrete time. I'm remembering that that's... So this thing would become stretched, and then you might add another replica on top of that. So that's, that's why this, this transform property looks um, more complicated here. Now remember that for the upsampling case, the time domain representation of upsampling was weird, but the frequency domain was just a rescaling. So it's just some sort of a symmetry in at least the, the ugliness of the expressions here. OK, so with that, let's look at the, um, what the received signal looks like now. So effectively, what we have is we have Z of T coming in getting sampled, getting filtered, getting downsampled, and then let's call this here y of n. And so then y of n is effectively equal to this right here. So after the sampling operation here, this is just z of n. So this is really just the convolution between z, let's put the, actually I'll just put the grx here, grx of l, z of, and this is going to be n minus l's convolution, but then we're plugging in nm here. So this is z of n capital M minus l. So that's effectively the operation that's happening here. Okay, so the other, the other point I wanted to mention is that, um, and again, I won't go through the derivation here, but if you look at this right here, think about this operation. 
we take our oversampled signal, Z, and we filter it by a long filter, G, and then we throw most of those samples away. So we did a whole bunch of convolution steps that weren't necessary. So there's also an equivalent filter bank structure that we can employ to simplify this operation here to reduce complexity by about a factor of M. So that's also um, similar to the one I showed you for the transmit side um, using the polyphase decomposition. So we'll do something on that in the homework as well. Okay, so any questions on this here? Yes. Oversampling first and then downsampling uh, helpers. Uh, why are we replacing the uh, first filtering and then continuous to downsampling also with the virus effective uh, blocks of PZ first? Yeah, so let's, okay, let's look at this um, over here. So the, um, okay, so one question is, is why are we replacing this filter? Yes, okay. So why we're replacing this is, is, is in general, um, filtering at analog is, is challenging. You know, it's, it, if, you, if you think about like the complicated pulse shaping function that we had, that weird like a raised cosine, it was like the same function times this funny looking function. So imagine having to realize that using um, capacitors and inductors. It's actually very hard, and it's not possible to do it exactly. You're going to have to do an approximation. And then whenever you implement filters in analog, especially complicated filters like that, um, the filter is very sensitive to the choice of components. And it's, uh, you know, if you want to change the bandwidth, you can't do it because it's already fixed. So, so essentially, the whole premise of, you know, DSP approach to communication is we want to get as much as possible into the digital signal processing side of the radio. Now, this is at the expense of complexity, because like we see here, you know, we take what would effectively be a, let's say, a low complexity analog filtering, and we replace it with a, a massive analog to digital converter and a digital filter. So there's some extra complexity and power, but then we get a whole bunch more flexibility from the resulting receiver. And what we're going to see in um, the lecture, let's see, not, not this Wednesday, but next week, is that th this whole receive structure is going to become much more complicated. So eventually, we're going to replace this with something else. And there's going to be synchronization here. And there's going to be other kinds of things that are happening that, that make this make a lot more sense. It would be very hard to do in analog. And, uh, like yeah. At the transmitter side, we, we were already sampling at a rate less than like this. Well, we were sampling, I mean, OK, so at the transmit side, when we do this, when we, when we shifted from this to this, so here, there, there was no sampling at all. You know, it's just things were happening in, in math land here. Now here, we have a discrete to continuous converter, but look, it's operating at a fraction of the symbol period, which means it's also operating at a faster rate. And so this would have to be chosen to satisfy Nyquist. Is that any other questions? Yeah. And, uh, another one, like, yeah. Uh, in the new block diagram of at the receiver, yeah. suppose if we sample at P directly instead of PZ, so uh, how will it affect our output? Like We are first oversampling and then downsampling. So right. instead of that, if we directly first sample at a rate lower than Nyquist, uh, how will it affect our output? Like, why is this better? Because effectively, we are anyways uh, adding the aliasing component. Right. The, the reason is that um, if you sample, if you don't satisfy Nyquist here, you, you cannot replace this filter equivalently by this filter. This is no longer the same thing. So first of all, I mean, you're not satisfying the equivalence property. And I mean, practically what happens is that you get aliasing, and that aliasing creates extra distortion and reduces your symbol error rate. You know, in reality, there's always a little bit of aliasing because filtering is not perfect, but you want to have as little as possible. And we'll see that, you know, even like a, a very small amount of aliasing can create or inter er interference or noise will create a very large symbol error rate. Yeah, so any other questions? Yeah, I guess I went through this kind of quickly. At, at one point, I used to teach like whole lecture on this receiver, but uh, it seemed like since you're implementing it in the lab anyway that we didn't need to, to spend as much time on it. 
All right, so let's go now to... Um, All right, so why can we why can we get rid of this or what? Yes, get rid of this and the equivalent would be the two of the this and two two where? T of T X yeah. R X of T and yeah. C to D. Yeah. Equivalent to C to D and D X. It's actually T to D, the Rx of X, and D to D. All yeah. the components of the Yeah, I mean, all I did was take, I mean, I just, I just plugged in for this here. I just plugged in this equivalent here. So that became that. I mean, I think everything else is the same. Um, wait, so, what, what do you want to combine? The uh, T R X of T and yeah. the module after that. This? Yes. Yeah, that's and continuous to discrete converter. Yes. Combine the two and make it like <coughs> the first two of the new one. Like T T D and then T R T R X of X. Mm. I don't. S I, I Which is basically saying why can't we just get rid of C to C uh, and C to D converters next side to side? Why can't we just get rid of that and just have this? Why can't we get rid of these two? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But that's what we did over here. So, so we did that. I mean, like, I think what you're saying is yeah. why can't you just first discretize C to C and then just apply it to the first one? Right, but that's what we're doing. But I mean, we're doing that in, in a you know mathematically correct way where there's no loss. I mean, you could just sort of arbitrarily sample this and filter it. But if you did that, if you satisfied Nyquist, you'd have too many samples. So you'd have more samples than symbols. So there'd be some problem there. So so that's why I'm trying to go through this in a more correct way because um, yes, the intuition is just yes, let's sample this and filter it. But there's a, a rate reduction that's happening because we could be using a pulse shaping filter that has excess bandwidth. So if we sample it at the Nyquist rate, we get out, let's say, two samples per symbol. So then we have extra samples. So we have to get rid of them somehow. And the somehow is exactly this, which with appropriate choice of TZ and T is just a downsampler. And so if we choose the TZ and the T correctly, then we can do exactly the intuition, right? We sample it, we digitally filter, and then we just have this downsampling here to account for the fact that we oversampled here. So, that, so it's just, it's really just a way to, to come up with this, um, with this structure. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Absolutely. Downsampling introduces aliasing, but, um, but look over here, right? So, so here, if we believe this is true, uh, all I did is plug this in here, which is this is equal to this, and then I just said that this is equal to this downsampling here. And yes, there's aliasing, but also remember that when we sampled a signal with this Nyquist pulse shape, we, we had inter symbol interference basically is aliasing. And the pulse shape is designed such that the aliasing is very special. And so even though there's aliasing, because we have, we're sampling at the right point and we're using an Nyquist pulse shape, we still, the, the whole thing is still works out. There's nothing, there's no new in, uh, interference or anything introduced here. But yeah, if you did this with an arbitrary signal, it, it wouldn't make any sense.
because you would get aliasing. If there's an audio signal, none of this would make sense. And that's exactly so what we're going to talk about next week is what if you don't sample at the right point? If you don't sample at the right point, this structure here, this, this won't work anymore. Equivalently, this won't work. And so we'll have to actually introduce new functionality here to deal with the fact that if we don't sample the symbol at the right point, we get this self-interference. And so that's, you know, so we're going to add essentially this whole block diagram here. We'll get a whole bunch of more blocks on the tr before and after this downsampler as we go through the class here. So other questions? All right, so hopefully the explanation in the book provides some additional information here. I feel like I did not convey the appropriate amount of information on this topic. The mutual information was low. All right, let's look at, um, I guess I'll, this is a good time to stop anyway. Uh, what I prepared today was actually nothing, so does anyone have any question? Related to the exam that hopefully is quick that they want to ask. Yes. Um, are you getting close to notes? What do you mean close to notes? Only have like seven weeks left in the They're up there for seven. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I didn't post the last one because it didn't scan correctly. But that one, um, actually, that one I think I posted this morning, or else I'll post it this morning. But they're all there. Yeah, if you can't see it, let me know. Okay, other questions? Any like a technical question or? Is it, uh, are the sample questions you like out of anything that we've read or is it generally from like a Well, it's really going to be out of anything that's um, in the lab or in the, in the book because, you know, sometimes I have um, not covered material as much in the lecture as I would have liked. And, you know, the homework is not necessarily sampling every possible problem, right? It's kind of a subsampling. Because if I gave you everything that I think that you should know, then everyone would complain because the homework was 10 pages long. So <laughs> yeah, there's some trade-off here. Um, I will not ask you about material that we have not covered in the lab lecture or homework. So for example, in chapter uh, three, there's material on least squares in there. We are going to do that in a few lectures, but, but that's not on the exam. But, but more or less, almost everything else in there is. I mean, the multi-rate identities also is in Chapter 3, but that will not be on this exam because we're going to cover it in the next homework assignment. So most everything else is in there. So look at the examples and look at the other sample problems. So yes? Yeah, you're responsible for, for the material in Chapter 2, but, I mean, you mean specifically, like, what is a convolutional code, or? Um, yeah. Yeah, so you're responsible for that on a, on a high level. I mean, we didn't go through, we, we talked about how the encoder works a little bit. We didn't talk at all about, really, the decoder. So decoder is the hard part of convolutional coding. So, like, I would expect you to be able to tell me, like, how is a convolutional code different than a block code, for example? But, you know, maybe I wouldn't ask you to decode a sequence using a convolutional code. And also, we just covered a very special case of the wide field of convolutional coding, too. So what, what I really want from Chapter 2 is that, you know, you have some intuition on other functions that we're not covering in the, the rest of class. Like, you know, what is error control coding? What does it mean to correct an error? How does that happen, you know? Okay, other exam related questions? A lot of interference today. Let's see if putting my phone in airplane mode helps. Huh, look at that. That was amazing. No, wait, it's still happening here. It's one of your phones. It's not my phone. Or the FCC is right, and phones actually do interfere in airplane mode.
which I can assure you they don't. Okay. Uh, any other exam-related questions? I guess no. Okay. Everyone is good with the exam material? And remember, the, the material in the labs is also on the exam. So be sure to study the labs and what you've done in the, in the lab and outside the lab, around the lab, in the neighborhood of the lab. Okay, so let's uh, continue here with um, trying to fill out the rest of that receiver block diagram. So this is maximum likelihood detection. So we're going to derive the ML detector, and then you should, based on this information, be able to implement it. Okay, so... So the ML detector, maximum likelihood detector here. So this, the story here starts essentially by um, looking at the signal after the sampling operation here. So if we use match filter and the composite pull shape, satisfies Nyquist, then Y of N. So remember, we started off the discussion of um, deriving the optimum pulse shape. We looked at this convolution. Plus this filtered composite noise. And we said that, you know, if, if we satisfy Nyquist, then we're going to get rid of all the inner symbol interference here, and we're going to be left with square root of EX times S of N here. And so that's a function of the Nyquist property, the match filter property, and our normalizations, so we don't end up with an extra scalar here. And then this right here is essentially filtered sampled noise. Let's call that V of N here. Now, it turns out that V of N is going to be, in general, ID complex Gaussian with zero mean and variance here, N naught. And this follows because the GRX is um, a match filter and forms a Nyquist pulse shape. In general, if you filter Gaussian noise, you'll get something that uh, is not IID and will have some other terms in it here. So from the perspective of the, the detector, so the detection problem is, is basically to so given an observation of y, so let's say y of n. So this is an actual realization, not as a not a random variable, it's a realization. find the best, in some sense, guess of S of N out of the possible symbols that could have been sent. And we'll call that best guess S hat of N here. And so that's the detec detected symbol. It's not strictly speaking an estimate because in signal processing we use estimate to denote a good guess of a continuous valued um, variable. And we use detection to denote this, this operation of selecting from one of a, a set of possible values, typically a finite set. So detection theory comes up in hypothesis testing. And effectively, what we're doing is we're going to be testing different hypotheses. You know, was, was one cent or was minus one cent? You know, so, so that's a detection problem. So now, to, to make any progress on this, so we, we did in one of the early homeworks a very simple detection problem where there was a repetition code, and some of those bits might have been flipped, and you had to 
to suggest a reasonable approach. And the typical reasonable approach that I think everyone su suggested was majority vote. You know, if you, if you send the same symbol 10 times and you get six ones and four minus ones, you, you kind of reasonably conclude that a one was sent, you know, and that, that's, now that, it's harder to do in, you know, with a more complicated mathematical model, this, to, to, to validate this kind of intuition that we have that, okay, you know, this, this should have been the right ones to pick. So what we're going to do is we're going to formulate some kind of an objective function, some way of, of calling our guess good, and then we're going to simplify that objective to find a formula that will give us s hat explicitly as a function of y. Because basically all we have is we're going to have, you know, we're going to have the ex, the noise power, the fact that this is Gaussian noise, and we have the observation of y. So we need some way to qualify s hat and say that this is a good you know, it, in, in the repetition coding case, we had just some intuition that that was reasonable. But here we're going to come up with something more formal than just the intuition. So to do this, what we need is a, um, a detection, some kind of an optimization to, to solve. Now, as you might have guessed from the topic of this section here, we're going to use what's called the maximum likelihood rule. So the maximum likelihood is a specific statistical, statistical likely, let's see, is impossible to, to spell and talk at the same time. Like we could, I can chew gum and talk. <laughs> it's like, no, spelling, no. So maximum likelihood here. So is a detection rule. You can also use this for estimation, but we're going to use this as a detection rule. So essentially here, it's going to be a detection rule. That maximizes the likelihood of the observation under the hypothesis that a given symbol was transmitted. So the notion of likelihood has a specific meaning in. Um, statistics. So the likelihood function in this case here is this conditional probability distribution function. So this is the conditional distribution of y, the observation given s, a symbol sent. And we're going to write this as y of n. So this is going to be a function of our observation y of n given s of n is equal to some symbol s here. So this is a conditional probability distribution function of y of n given s of n. Now, let's look at the, again, I'll, I'll rewrite this over here so that y of n is equal to the square root of ex s of n plus V of n here. Now, V of n is Gaussian. If you condition on knowing S of n, this is a constant. So what is the distribution of a constant plus a Gaussian? This is Gaussian. The mean will be the mean, in this case the constant. The variance will be the variance of the noise here. So we can say that in this Gaussian channel, that F of y given S I'll just write generically as, you know, like this, is equal to 1 over pi n naught. This is complex Gaussian. The n naught was the variance. That's, that's hopefully what you expect there. And then this is going to be e to the minus y minus square root of e x s magnitude squared. Square root of e x is the mean. That's y. And then this whole thing here divided by n naught. That's the noise variance here. And so, again, this conditional distribution function is because V of n is IID. Actually, the IID doesn't matter because we're looking at just a single shot, complex Gaussian. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to figure out Given this likelihood function here, which symbol 
is most likely. So to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to replace, so here, this is a generic function here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to plug in here my specific sample of y of n, and I'm going to look at all the different possible values of s and see which one gives me the biggest likelihood function. And that's actually it. So the so ML detector is going to solve an optimization. So that optimization is going to be, I'm going to write this like this here, s hat of n is equal to the arg max. So, so arg max is the argument that maximizes a function. So I'm going to search over all values of s in my constellation and find the one that maximizes this function here, y of n given s of n equals s. So that's essentially maximum likelihood function, maximum likelihood detection problem. Now, because we have already established that with additive Gaussian noise that we know the form of y, we can simplify this and we can write this as arg max of s in c, 1 over pi and naught, e to the minus y of n minus square root of exs squared divided by n naught. Now, remember that, again, we're not looking for the maximizer of the function. We're looking for the argument that maximizes it here. Because of that, um, we can make some simplifications here. So first of all, this scalar here, positive scalar doesn't change anything, right? The maximization doesn't change the maximizer. It changes the maximum value, not the maximizer. So we can get rid of it. So we can rewrite this as argmax of s in c e to the minus y of n minus square root of ex s squared over n naught. Well, we can just keep going here. So suppose that um, what we are optimizing right here is an exponential function. So it's like, e, in this case, it's like e to the minus x here. So let's say it's e to the x here. So if you're trying to maximize some function, uh, e, some e to the function of x, e is so the x is um, monotonically increasing, we can equivalently maximize the argument. So we could, this maximizer is the same as this maximizer. Now then, let's see here. So we're trying to maximize the negative of this absolute value, which is always positive here. And we have the scalar. So equivalently, we can just minimize this here. So this is equivalent to the arg min of s in c, y of n minus square root of ex s squared. And this, for the sake of this problem here, this is as far as we can go in simplifying. So this is actually um, the answer here. Now, so look at this um, problem here for a minute here. So, so basically what we do is we take the observation y of n here. We take our symbol s in the constellation. We scale it by ex. We compute this difference and square it. We do that for all the possible symbols, and we find the one that is um, closest. And that's the symbol that minimizes this. And so we say that that symbol is our s hat of n here. And this right here, this is just a distance function in Euclidean space, right? So this is just the distance between two complex numbers. So this is often called minimum distance decoding. I'll put here Euclidean distance is what's important for the um, additive white Gaussian noise maximum likelihood detection problem. Now, I want to emphasize again now, if you go through here with a different kind of noise, you won't get this answer. 
So in um, optics, for example, the noise is often shot noise. It's not Gaussian. It has a completely different kind of distribution. There, you don't get this kind of a detector. So the form of this detector right here, it's really just because we had the additive Gaussian noise. And it's actually very nice. In many cases, it just won't simplify like this. And so the intuition of it is that um, if we had, so let's look at the case of 4QAM here. So these are my symbols here, you know, and, and these points. So what I'll do is I will scale up this constellation point. So I'll make this point here square root of EX over 2 comma square root of EX over 2, right? So this is my square root of EX times square root of 1 half, square root of 1 half here, right? So that's like the first constellation point, and so on here. So this is my scaled constellation. And then what's going to happen is I got an observation here. Let's call that y of n. Well, I'm going to compute the distance between y of n and this point, this point, this point, and this point. I'm going to find the one that's closest, right? In that case, it's this here. So then I would spit out for y of n that s hat is equal to this symbol here. And if you know, y landed over here, I would do the same thing, and I would get a different answer. The squared, it doesn't matter, but I'm not sure if it's any easier to compute an absolute value without the square. Otherwise, is which distance? Yes, that would be the absolute value then. Um, I suppose, but I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't matter because you're comparing. You know, you're comp you 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 can compare all these in absolute value, or you can compare the square. I guess what I'm thinking is, what you're going to have, you know, at your receiver is a complex number here and a complex number here. So how would you get the magnitude of that complex number? I, I kind of think you're going to, you know, take this difference and then you're going to look at the square and take the square root. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's a simpler way. So it doesn't matter. Now, there's a couple things to mention here. Um, one is that, lo look at this right here. So you can kind of see by doing an experiment in your head here that wherever I put a point here, it's going to map to this point. Right? It's always going to be closer. If it's here, it's always closer to this point than any other point. So that partitioning of the space is called the Verona region. And so we often break this detection problem up into these Verona regions. And so for this, um, so let me, I guess let me give the formal definition here. So the Voronoi region for a constellation symbol S is the set of observations such that y minus square root of ex S squared is less than y minus square root of ex SK, sorry, SL, for S in constellation SL, in constellation SL not equal to S here. So the Voronoi region for a particular symbol S is the set of all observations that map to that symbol. And so going back again to this Forquam setting here, if I ask for like the Voronoi regions here, this would be, we could call this, you know, V of S1, this is V of S2, let's say, 
V of S3, V of S4 here. So these are the different regions here. Now you can see that if we had like 16 QAM, the Rona regions would be, you know, much more complicated. So if we had 16 QAM, the Veronia regions actually would look something like this. You'd have some that are finite and some that are strips and some that are quarter planes and, you know, be more complicated here. So why we need the concept of Voronoi region um, is two reasons. One is when we compute the probability of error. So the probability of error is going to be the probability that even though we sent this point here, it falls somewhere else. And so we'll have to integrate over the Voronoi regions. So that's complicated, but that's where we need it. The other reason we need it is that it's possible to simplify these calculations further. So for example, um, how do I know, in this case here, that a complex number lies in this Verona region? What can I do to easily check that? Well, you could check, even simpler than that, you could basically just check the sign. Just check the sign of the number here, right? So, any point in this Verona region here, the sign of the real part, this is your couple of comparisons, is greater than zero, and the imaginary part is greater than zero. So, for example, for the um, for QAM, you could simplify the detection rule based on this concept here. So, instead of having to compute the squared value and comparing it with all the different terms, you could actually just compute y and look at its signs and see if it's greater than zero or less than zero. So, so if you think about that, that simplifies the, the calculation a lot. We don't have to compute the absolute value of the square anymore. But it only works for 4QAM. If, if I gave you a different constellation, that wouldn't work. So for implementation, though, that's perfectly reasonable. So, so essentially, we can use the Verona region. So let me write that down here. So Verona region used for the symbol error rate calculation. and use to simplify the detection algorithm. All right, that's it uh, on this uh, maximum likelihood detection. So any questions about this here? Yes. Um, yes, they should be. Yeah, they should change. Yes, I think so. I'm not sure here. Here will they change? I think in general they'll change, except for this four quam problem. I have a feeling they're the same. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all it's it's a function of what happens up there, right? So again, so for a different detector, you can get um, different Verona region. Any other questions on this? So this, all this detection comes from uh, statistics, and there's applications there where, you know, suppose that you, you know, you, you come up with like a, like a hypothesis here. Let's see, that um, wireless students like to drink milk. I don't know if it's true or not, but, you know, so then I could ask everybody, and then we make some statistical assumptions, and then we try to, try to, to determine if the hypothesis is true or not. And also comes up in radar, you know, where you're trying to see, okay, is there a target in this measurement or not? So it comes up all over the place here. Um, fortunately, we only need the simple calculations. Now, the final thing we're going to do today is 
the probability of symbol error. It's really not my phone, it's off, so. Do you have a phone? <laughs> you have a good phone? Or is it leaking RF over in my microphone? <laughs> I don't know, though. You're always sitting there, so it, it, it doesn't seem, I don't know what it is. It's very strange. Does anyone here have a new phone? Aha! Is it a high quality phone or? <laughs> hmm. But you've had it though, the last few weeks, right? Okay, so you're here, so yeah. So it's not. I don't know. I don't know what it is. It's very strange. Hmm. Really? So it stopped now. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Well, let's wait and see if it comes back. All right, so the probably a simple error. So th the whole thing with detection is we like to know how often we're making a mistake. Now, we can't know any given time if we're making a mistake, because if we knew that, then we wish we wouldn't make the mistake, right? That doesn't make any sense. But, but we would like to know how often we make mistakes, because generally speaking, we would like to know this, just as human beings, not, not even as communication engineers. The Error, the performance in this case of our detector is measured by the probability of error. Now, if you were studying a radar problem, you'd actually look at the probability of a miss and the probability of a false alarm, which are kind of different. You know, the, the probability of false alarm would be something like, you know, you make a you decide you decide a particular hypothesis is true when it isn't. Like, for example, you know, the U.S. is being bombarded by nuclear weapons, and you decide the hypothesis is true. Oops, it was incorrect, and so shouldn't have retaliated. That would be a big, big mistake, right? So um, the, that in the radar problems, there's an error event associated with deciding on kind of one hypothesis or the other, and one is typically a lot more important and has bigger consequences than the other. In digital communication, you know, we basically just want to get the symbols. So really, we just want to know, did we make a mistake or not? And we don't really say that making this mistake is, is catastrophic and that mistake is okay. So the, the challenging part with computing the probability of error is that um, we can find it in, in closed form in some cases, but not others. So if you take digital communication class, you spend a couple weeks computing these for like all kinds of weird modulations. Uh, which we don't have the time nor patience to do here. So what we're going to do here is we're going to, to compute um, the following expression here. So for equally likely symbols, for additive white Gaussian noise, we're going to write the probability of error expression. Now it turns out that it's a function of the SNR even though we haven't shown that yet, but it will be true, so I'm just going to write it here already. So the symbols are equally likely that you can compute the probability of error simply by conditioning on each event here. So the probability of error, given that I sent symbol S of M over EX over N naught here, right? So basically I just, um, because if I send one symbol and not the other, these events are independent here, so I can obtain the probability of error by summing up the probability of errors for each different event times the probability of each event occurring, which is the same, 1 over m here. Okay, so that calculation here um, is what we're going to try to, to compute, or in this case here, approximate. So let's look at this here. What is PE of S of m? So PE of S of m is the probability that SM is detected incorrectly given that SM was transmitted. And though we can rewrite this as the, the sum L equals zero, sorry, am I summing over, yeah, zero, zero, zero to M minus one, L not equal to M, of the probability that SM 
is decoded as S of L given SM was transmitted. And if you, disco if you decode SM as S of L, then it can't be decoded as S of K. So these events are also um, mutually exclusive here. So now, um, effectively, what we're going to do is we're going to compute the sum over all possible combinations of sending an S and decoding it as a different one. So that's basically what we have to compute. That computation in exact form is rather tedious. So we're going to rely on a trick, which is called the uh, union bounds. And so that trick, and, th and this is something that is um, it's a bound, but actually I found it very useful, and it, it's, it's used in, um, for all kinds of research purposes, because most of the time we don't actually care to know the exact probability of error. We just want to know its trend. So to compute this here, we're going to use the pairwise error probability, or PEP. Pairwise error probability is also used to compute bounds for, for fading channels, for inner symbol interference, for convolutional codes, for trellis codes. Uh, so it's a, it's a rather general uh, a technique here. So generally, the pairwise error probability is, is simply the probability that symbol S of M, so we, so we write this like this, symbol S of M is decoded as symbol S of L here. And this is how we write it here. And so let me, let me actually write it uh, over here first. It's the probability S of M is decoded or detected as S of L, assuming the constellation has only S of M and S of L. Here. So instead of assuming that the constellation has a whole gazillion points, it only has two points, S of M and S of L. And if you think about it from over here, if I go back to my Verona region plot, if I got rid of this point and this point, my Verona regions would become bigger. So effectively, I am upper bounding the possibility that this point gets decoded as this point here. So because the Verona region, effectively, if there's only these two points here, will, will be bigger than it was. So now, and so it's bigger, so that means there's more opportunities there for error. So for the additive white Gaussian noise channel here, this probability that S of M is decoded as S of L, it turns out to be, and we won't go through this derivation here, but it turns out that it's equal to Q of square root of EX over N naught times the distance between S of M and S of L squared divided by 2. So effectively, what I'm saying is that, you know, if we have some complex plane here, we have two points. This could be S of M. This could be S of L. I'm going to draw a line here. I'm going to integrate over all the possible error events and compute that probability. And that probability is given by this equation up here. And it's only a function of this distance here, divided by 2. So that distance divided by 2, that's the, that's the point where this Verona region intersects this line here. So that's why it's distance over 2. That's the minimum distance to the Verona region boundary. That's minimum distance over 2. And this EX over N naught is essentially telling us how strong the tail is of the Gaussian here. So this is SNR. And this is, minimum, this is the distance between these two points here over 2. OK, so now we're going to use this quantity here to upper bound the conditional probability of error here, and thus this conditional error here. So that's, that's the plan here. So we use this observation here that probability of S of M given S of M, EX over N naught, 
is less than or equal to the sum for L from 0 to M minus 1, L not equal to M, of the pairwise error probability. The probability of S of M goes to S of L. Here. Now, this was equal to the probability that S of M is misdecoded as S of L. But remember, the pairwise error probability assumes only two points in the constellation. So that probability is bigger than if there were more points, or it's at least, this, at worst, the same. So this is an upper bound here. So now all we're going to do is we're going to plug this upper bound into the other bound here. And we're going to get PE of EX over N naught is less than or equal to 1 over M. Sum over M equals 0 to M minus 1. Sum over L equals 0 to M minus 1. L not equal to M. I'm going to substitute in here for Q. So I'm going to get Q of square root EX over N naught. S of M minus S of L squared over 2. So that's the probability of error. Uh, this is called the um, union upper bound here. Now, we can keep going here. So there's different, different refinements of this union bound. And, um, and this is called the, the union bound because effectively we're taking the unions of these um, basically by increasing, yeah, increasing the size of the Verona region we are kind of neglecting that, that overlap there. So that's why it's called like the union. Like you're, you're taking in more error opportunities than you had. Now, um, this is also, this is fine, but for purposes of developing intuition, we actually want to come up with a even simpler expression here. So let's define the minimum distance of the constellation, which we call d min squared, as the minimum of m l, m not equal to l, of S of M minus S of L squared. This is a property of the constellation here. So, so the minimum distance here upper bounds all of these terms here. So, and then actually I suppose I should give you the definition of the Q function. That's probably helpful. So the Q function, this is just the integral for the tail of this Gaussian. It's e to the minus t squared over 2 dt. And you can see here is that this Q function here is um, decreasing with x here. So that um, if I want to come up with the largest value of Q, I take the smallest argument. The smallest argument is the minimum distance here. So I can then further rewrite PE of EX over N naught as less than or equal to sum of 1 over M, M equals 0 to M minus 1. So there's M minus 1 of these here because I have L not equal to M. So then I get M minus 1 here, Q of square root of EX over N naught, D min squared over 2. So I'm summing over m of these. I have m minus 1. I have an m here. So that's equal to m minus 1 q square root ex over n naught d min squared over 2 here. And so then this is the final union Brown expression that we'll use in the class here. It's really just, sorry, it's really this here. And then if you plot this function out here, you'll see that it's actually loose at low SNR. So effectively, what we have is we have a formula that happens to be a function of EX over N naught and the minimum distance of the constellation that we can use to evaluate the probability of error, or at least a bound on it. So if you have a different constellation, you would plug in a different value of D min here. If you have a higher power, you plug in a larger value of Vx. A smaller power, a smaller value of Vx. And that would give you different corresponding um, terms here. Now, I guess I'm basically out of time here. Let me give you the final. These expressions are available in the book here. But let me just give you as, as an example here. For MQAM, there's a nice closed form solution for d min. It's 6 over m minus 1. 
And then if you were to plug in, you get the probability of error union bounds as equal to m minus 1 times q square root ex over n naught. d min squares, this would end up being 3 over m minus 1 here. And it turns out that the exact form is also available, which we don't derive here. But the exact form is going to be is equal to 4, 1 minus 1 over square root of m, q of square root ex over n naught, 3 over m minus 1, minus 4, 1 over 1 minus square root of m squared, q of square root of ex over n naught, 3 m minus 1 squared. So just for reference, this is the exact formula. And in some of the homework problems, I may ask you to use the exact formula here. And what you can see is that in both cases, the arguments of the Q function are the same. But here we have an additional term that subtracts off that makes this a little bit smaller. And also, instead of multiplying by m minus 1, multiplying by 4 times 1 over 1 minus square root of m here. And so this is why this is always bigger than this. Actually, it's, it's going to be bigger for. Yeah, even m equals 2. Well, m equals 4 is the smallest one. It's bigger. So, and then if you were to plot all of these together, you know, we typically plot ex over n naught in a db scale. And you would see something like, this would be like, it's like a waterfall curve, and then it would look something like, the union bound would be something like this here. So it would be a gap there. And at low SNR, it will be not following very well. And then the final thing is, just to give you some intuition here, the Q of x, we can upper bound as 1 half e to the minus x squared. Um, actually, it should be over, I want to say x squared over 2 here. So you can think about the Q of x is behaving kind of like an e to the x squared. And so that's where this waterfall behavior happens here. So essentially, that's the main parts of the lecture here. Oh, man, I forgot to put my probability of symbol error analysis page up. I'll have to cut that back in. All right. So you should be able to derive this union bounds and then calculate the probability of symbol error in using both the union bound and the exact formula. And also, I'll give you problems where we don't have a QAM constellation, so you have to compute the minimum distance, compute the union bounds, and, and plot those as well. Yes, it is just mean, but it's fun. Okay, all right, that's it.